Uh, I just I saw my I saw my bumps and my bumps look worse than your bumps. Oh um, right, okay. Well, you know, oh, I see. <laughs> okay, this is we'll weird, see. Dan. It's an experiment. We'll find out what happens. Yeah, I have no idea how this is gonna go. Um, Dan, I don't know if you really want to fill people in, but we're not in the same room anymore. We are we? no longer in the same room. It is very sad. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. Oh, it's unfortunate for the for the um, for the ease with which we can make this podcast. We're yeah, not in the same well, and also anymore. unfortunate for the fifty percent of the audio quality where it's like I live next to an extremely busy road and there's going to be like honking and stuff. And I can't just blame that. You know, now it's got to get blamed on me. And not yes, yeah. <laughs> it was both of us before. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and now we can't uh, we talk about. It. It's just you'll have to fill me in. On the various goings on on the roundabout. Well, there is some we weird record. stuff going on on the roundabout right now. So you know, okay. I don't know yeah. if I keep peeking, that's what's happening. Um, we haven't done an episode in a while. We haven't done an episode in a while. Back. I, I, uh, I was moving, so I've now left. I've moved. Which direction is it? West. <laughs> I've moved west. <laughs> I've moved joined. West, I've joined the westward migration. <laughs> um, gone about as far west as it's possible to go in the UK. Yeah, Dan has an absurd amount of sunlight right now. I'm like actually very jealous because Dan just saw out my window and it's like, wow, it's dark there. Huh? And I was like, yeah, all right, all right, buddy. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you. I'll keep you apprised of the how far we've gotten through the sunset. Yeah, let me know when it's dark. Cornwall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking dark. speaking of seasons, Dan, um, my first beans just came up, which is very exciting. Right. It took them forever, and <laughs> are they this in the is ground exciting. Or are they in are they in module trays? They're not module trays. I should have put them in module trays. That's why they took like two and a half, three weeks to come up. Although they are under fleece, so they need to kind of get their act together. Um, what? what? What date are we on now? May doc- oh, late October. Yeah, I planted okay. them. I'm going to plant another crop next weekend. Anyways, regardless, I will be planting aqua dulce later. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, this is basically how we know that time has passed here at Auxiliary Statements, you know, when beans get planted. And um, this also means that it's kind of more or less our uh, two-year podcast anniversary. So well done, Dan. We've done it. Two years. <laughs> well done, us. Well done, us. Congratulations, Jack. Yeah, that means we're averaging about uh, maybe like seven new listeners an episode. That's <laughs> correct. So hey, look at us. We're doing it. Yeah. And the longevity of this podcast was enhanced immeasurably when we decided to just stop trying to relentlessly produce an episode every week <laughs> yeah i don't know how we did that that was actually insane know. yeah i can't remember looking back at it now hopefully hopefully the quality of the episodes has gone up at least marginally let's hope, so. let's hope i mean we're not reading like stuff quicker i don't think if anything we busted out like the ella meekson's wood way faster i mean i know it took us like 18 episodes to get through the ralph Miliband book but Took us a long time to get through capitalism and the web of life, so you know we're we're doing something. Hopefully, the quality is going up because the quantity certainly isn't. Um, but uh, we were speaking just before this, Dan, also about getting your live reaction. Um, we're recording this on Monday um, to your new, I suppose, our new God Emperor Rishi Sunak. Officially, the man, the myth, the legend is the new uh, Prime Minister. I, I uh, think that. Perhaps we should have seen this coming. Perhaps that's just hindsight. But um, we, we saw this coming, didn't we? I was like, it's going to be Penny it's Morris. Be Morris the wild card. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, I, I guess, um, I mean, I, I don't know whether we live in a rational country. We certainly don't. In some kind of rational scenario where the person that came second and they needed to coronate somebody picking the person that came second in the most recent leadership contest and who all of whose predictions about how disastrous Listrus's government and um, prime premiership was going to be came true yeah, <laughs> i suppose it was the obvious solution i mean i'm not sure how well um he will unite the warring conservative party yeah. um it's funny how rishi sunak somehow now is cast as like a uh, some kind of Tory moderate centrist kind of like um, in reality his politics are about as right wing as they come so abhorrent fairly abhorrent yeah. <laughs> I mean I, to be fair if they wanted to like heal the contradiction of the Tory party which is to say like constituents and like you know the actual people that they represent right like perhaps just excluding the constituents entirely from selecting the um prime minister it's not the best way to go about doing that but it's the way that they've chosen uh so we'll see 
Do you, I, I've not actually paid any attention today, today or yesterday. Do you know what the actual cause of event was? Yeah, I think it was. Actually, I was going to say, this is the funniest situation. We had said, by the way, we had said on our stream, we were going to start streaming on Twitch. We have a Twitch. We've just got to kind of figure it out. We've done it once and I fucked up and forgot to uh, hit record. But um, we're going to start doing that more. So and nobody more. knows that we... <laughs> whether we did or didn't make really apposite predictions oh, we about what was going to happen so like yeah <laughs> um we predicted the only the time we've ever thing. predicted anything correctly no what did we <laughs> yeah, predict? exactly i'll just keep forgetting to hit record yeah. predictions. <laughs> we predicted that the funniest thing would be boris getting it again right although i think that we've actually gotten the funniest thing because what happened was you know, Boris was literally like on vacation in Barbados. Someone must have been like, Liz Truss has just resigned. She's announced she's resigning. He's like, jumps up off his chaise lounge, spills his pina colada, gets back on a plane. It's like, I'm, you know, it's Napoleon returning from Elba. It's, you know, him coming on. He's going to make his grand reappearance in the UK and become the prime minister again. And then some sort of Tory MP just like politely took him aside and was like, you absolutely cannot run again. Do not put your name forward. So as soon as he got back to the UK, he was like, uh, I'm actually not uh, putting my name forward. It's just not the right time. Uh, so who knows what that means. But um, then it was between Penny Morden and Rishi Sunak. Penny Morden was struggling to get the requisite like 100 MPs to back her. And then just like a few hours ago, they were just like, all right, call it. Like, you know, she basically came out and was like, OK, fine. It can just be Rishi Sunak. So there was no actual vote. It was just that he was the only candidate, I believe. Well, Democracy. <laughs> I mean, I still stand by what I said on that stream, which is it's, a, it's very definitely a bit of a poison chalice, this being prim, uh, prime minister now. Um, the economic damage that was done by Liz Truss isn't going to go away just because she's gone away. Um, and the combination of uh, the sort of declining economic fortunes of the country before this whole uh, six-week debacle... Um, and then lumped on top of that all of the resulting uh, increases in um, uh, well the increased cost of government borrowing and then the necessary increase in um, interest rates have now put us in a position where it seems like there's going to be a new phase of austerity which I think Rishi Sunak may get a certain amount of glee in being the one yeah. to uh institute but i don't think it's going to win him any favors or mm. support in the country so um yeah he might be a bit of a theresa may kind of character now in that he's just a hostage to the party um he's the person that's going to have to implement all of these um wildly unpopular policies and then take the blame for that i don't even wonder whether he will be the person that stands as their leader in the next election or not yeah. maybe they'll get rid of him even before the election comes maybe around they're, maybe they're that's when they'll have boris the yeah that's yeah, when exactly. they'll have boris oh you know they have, have somebody else do all the events. dirty work and then the populist either whether it's boris or whether it's penny morden or something comes mm -hmm. in and attempts to salvage something by not being rishi you know they're already ready to blame <laughs> rishi for everything anyway that's the tagline he's not rishi <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know dan i i uh I have a hard time believing that uh, the Goldman Sachs hedge fund, hedge fund guy is going to take any sort of glee in any kind of brutal austerity measures. I find that, quite frankly, an insult. Um, <laughs> isn't he one of like the wealthiest MPs ever, if not the wealthiest MP? It's some real sicko stuff. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by that. He's Yeah, he's wildly, wildly, disgustingly wealthy. Disgusting that he actually, like, it's just memeable that he worked for Goldman Sachs. It's like, oh my God, oh dear. Um <laughs> Yeah, so predictions for uh, this coming year, uh, brutal austerity. I don't know. What do you think the possibilities are? The possibilities just zero that there can be a, a um, general election. Like it seems like it would have to take some sort of general strike or the threat of a general strike, which would take the TUC actually getting up off of its ass and being like, okay, let's do this for that to happen. Um, or that I, I don't even know. Do you think it could happen before the like actual like kind of allotted time for it? Uh, well, I mean, the only people that can call a general election are the Conservative Party, I think. Exactly. Right. But um, if they're forced into it. If the, well, I don't know what power would force them into it. Mm. Um, I, I mean, people have been speculating that one of the things that could happen would be that um, Prince Charles just takes it upon himself to dissolve Parliament. Oh because, my I mean, God, yes. Because it, it, it is a power retained by the monarch to dissolve Parliament. 
Now it's traditionally done by <laughs> the the prime minister requesting um, a dissolution of parliament so that they can have an election. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I, th- I think there were only two ways to do it, right? Either the well, if there was some kind of vote of no confidence in the government, which is something that can happen in parliament, but um, it seems quite unlikely that a, a sufficiently many Tory MPs will vote for no confidence in the the government that their party leads. Um, partic- well, I mean, it, uh, particularly when the polls are so dire for them at the moment. So. Um, so I can see this sort of dragging on, and I suppose one of the benefits of one of the benefits that they were um, saying that Boris had actually was that, well, at least he does still have the mandate that he gained in twenty nineteen, right? So um, he does have some democratic legitimacy or some authority, um, and I do wonder whether some of that can be passed on to Rishi Sunak somehow. I mean, he was the the chancellor during that election, and he was the chancellor afterwards. If he can if he is going to um follow through to some extent with what was in that manifesto um if he can claim to represent and uh bear that majority that was given to the conservative party in 2019 then maybe he has some amount of legitimacy um i mean obviously <laughs> scare quotes legitimacy it's all very kind of like uh, murky constitutional nonsense um, you are forgetting, Dan, that Boris Johnson does continue to hold the mandate of heaven. And I believe that that is the only mandate that matters these days. So that would be awesome if Boris Johnson just came back and was like, I, can you, what mandate do I have? I have the mandate of heaven. And everyone was like, huh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't surprise me if he tried something like that. Uh, so good things are coming um, to an already brutally austericized country. Um, let's have some more. Why not? Let's go for it. Everybody's going on strike right now. Um, As we speak, ambulance drivers, oh, what a brutal thing to say. Ambulance drivers are uh, voting to go on strike. Um, UCU nationwide just voted to go on strike. Um, Dock workers are going on strike up in, I think, Liverpool. I could be wrong about that, though. Um, So, yeah, good things, I suppose. (laughs) Um, Dan? We can well, no longer put it, it off any further. It, it, here's the question, Jack. Is this oh, the final crisis? <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes. Yes, Dan. Is this the final crisis? No, Dan, but this is the permanent crisis. Uh-huh. Um, that's what we're reading today, folks. We've been trying to put it off <laughs> for a little <laughs> bit, as you can tell. Um, but it took us four weeks, and we finally read uh, The Permanent Crisis, Heinrich Grossman's Interpretation of Marx's Theory of Capitalist Accumulation, by none other than Paul Maddock, um, piece in 1934. And um, very good. This is just like a 20 odd page essay kind of summarizing a lot of um, Grossman's theories. I think that I was interested in this one mainly because um, I haven't had a whole lot of exposure to Grossman before, but I found it interesting that one of the go-to essays that people talk about when they talk about Grossman was written by Paul Maddock. Because I think like unfairly so, Grossman is kind of has been written off by some people, specifically like Frankfurt School types, as like a Stalinist, which is very funny. That's kind of unfair. But Paul Maddock, not a Stalinist. That's one thing you can say about him. Um, so I was just interested to know kind of how this essay folded out. And it was really interesting because it seems like you can see where a lot of Maddox thought has actually come from. And then it seems like actually this arch left com was really inspired by a lot of this crisis stuff. Um and it wound up being very illuminating. I had to read it several times, um, but um, the general idea behind it is relatively simple. And um, yeah, we'll get into the weeds here in a bit, Dan. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it was really good. I mean, I've thought of Paul Mattet for quite a long time as um, one of the more prominent popularizers. I mean, he's not alive now, but historically one of the more prominent popularizers of, um, well, the general theory of... Um, capitalist crisis stemming from a tendential fall in the rate of profit he's definitely something he advocates for that theory being a real uh feature of the capitalist mode of production i suppose um and yeah as you say a lot of that stems from his engagement with uh henry grossman's reinterpretation of marxism i suppose um i didn't really know a huge amount about grossman in particular before reading this and i suppose i 
only know marginally more now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'm, yeah, I am quite fascinated by Grossman's interpretation of Marx, and uh, um, it's not so much modifications that he makes as what the way Matic presents it. Anyway, what Grossman is doing is drawing out latent um, tendencies or sort of more broad implications of what Marx is saying, um, and extending Marx's analysis of uh, capitalist production to one that includes. A theory of uh, capitalist crisis, and yeah. he's, he's suggesting that uh, a theory of crisis um, can be very relatively easily drawn out of Marx's theory of um, capitalism. So the argument that like Marx never really presents a theory of crisis, I think in in Grossman's eyes and therefore Matic's eyes as well, isn't entirely unfound. It isn't entirely founded, right? Because it's there, latent under the surface, kind of thing. Um, yeah. You only have to look at Marx's theories of capitalist reproduction to find it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's interesting because pretty much this entire essay is just Matic being like, here's what Grossman says. And then at the end, in like the last page or two, he kind of just barely begins to extrapolate it um, towards like what it means for politics and the political level. And you can see, oh, okay, this is actually how this like vein of thinking of the tangible fall and the rate of profit and all of this stuff actually um, feeds into Maddox thinking into this kind of like left commie kind of councilist kind of stuff. Um, and it's really fascinating, but I think to get to that first, we do actually need to kind of talk about <laughs> what this theory of crisis actually is. Uh -huh. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, Dan, but the basic idea behind all of this is a relatively simple one. And it is just the idea that what we've spoken about before this idea of say like the two types of capital that a capitalist invests into their product, right? It's this idea of investing in labor, but also investing into the means of production, right? Constant capital, variable capital. And it's this idea that because of competition and because of the constant necessity to, you know, the capitalist can't just take all of the money that they've made and like fritter it away in Barbados drinking pina coladas, right? Like they have to take a large proportion of that money and reinvest it back into production so that they can get, say, if they're making TVs, machines that up productivity so that they can make more TVs, right, than their competitors or make better TVs or whatever. And the basic idea behind this theory of crisis is that the ratio between what is invested into labor and what is invested into constant capital, into the machines and all of that stuff, um, slowly starts to get a bit out of whack in the favor of more money having to be invested into constant capital, into the means of production to kind of up productivity. Um, and this has a number of different implications. The main one perhaps being that if we take for granted that the only source of value is labor, right? Or the only source of new value, I should say, where value is kind of created, um, then losing surplus value at the expense of more of an investment into constant capital has pretty dire uh, uh, implications for the capitalist, right? So that's kind of the base that all of this is built off of, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> well said. Yeah, it's, it's, he, he starts this essay by talking about like Marx's general theory of history as being like uh, a development in the productive forces of um, humanity, I suppose, uh, in a way which struck me initially as being quite, well, it, it is almost presented as being quite um, uh, technologically determinist in some yeah. respects. Um whether that is or isn't his general view of history, he veers away from that quite quickly and actually starts to talk very specifically about um, the specific characteristics of um, capitalist production um, and talking about what the motor force for capitalist production is as being um, the law of value, I suppose, but what that then entails is... Um, a necessity, unlike any other mode of production before it, a necessity under capitalism to um, to develop the productive forces, i.e., um, the sort of like machinery. What in Marx's parlance is called the uh, fixed capital, um, because although it is variable capital, i.e., wage labor, which is the thing that uh, contributes the value the thing which represents the uh, the worth of the things that are produced, capitalists are required to manipulate wage labor in a lot of ways, I suppose. 
And the main way they're trying to do that is to um, increase the productivity of labor. Um, that's how they grow their uh, surplus, I suppose. They have to make labor more productive. They have to be able to extract more wealth from labor. Um, and that's the, the main drive of capitalism, right, is the expansion of surplus value, the extraction of greater and greater surplus value. Um, and they do that in a number of ways. You can just, like, discipline labor more, right? You can make it more efficient just by, like, making people slack off less and work harder. And you can make them – you can extend the working day, right? You can make them um, work for longer. But at a certain point in time, those those – um, dials can't really be manipulated in the mode of production anymore and what you actually have to do is combine labor with technology in a way that uh, sort of like increases the productivity of that labor and as you say one of the sort of byproducts of that is this change in um, well a change in the relationship between fixed and variable capital a change in the relationship between uh, what is contributed by to, to production by wage labor and what is contributed to, to production by um, fixed capital machinery and this kind of stuff. I've never understood why it is the case that this is called an increase in the organic composition of capital because I've always thought that <laughs> like think... if you if you're if you're if there are fewer uh, organic beings in the process, presumably it will be a decrease. But maybe I'm just misunderstanding the terminology. This is another one of like, I hate to say it, but another one of the phrases that Marx uses that is not helpful. Calling it the organic rate, of, that is not helpful, the organic <laughs> composition of capital, for exactly the reason that you mentioned. What's organic <laughs> about it? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but yeah, th you're right to talk about kind of this idea of um, absolute relative surplus value. And in a large part of the beginning of capital, when Marx is talking about like manufacture, the manufacture period, right? He spends a really long, very boring chapter talking about um, the working day and talking about the struggles that people have had in mainly England to um, increase and decrease the working day. And he basically says that, you know, he talks about these horrible conditions of people in Manchester and in Leeds or whatever about like, you know, literally uh, factories working 24 hours a day and people having like 16 hour shifts and then the next person coming in so that nothing ever stops It's 16 hour shifts. And then you get kids to come in and it's all this horrible stuff, but through class struggle, right? Like there's a limit on absolute surplus value, right? Like you can no longer lengthen the cert, the working day for two reasons. One, because people need to like rest and not die, right? Like if you had a 24 hour working day, there'd be no rest and people would die. So you can't do that. But also because of class struggle, workers are going to go, yeah, I don't think so. Right. And that's how you get like the eight hour day or whatever, right, is through class struggle. It isn't just because at a certain point, capitalists were bestowed with this like benevolence from above being like, you shall, we shall allow you to have this. So you're absolutely right. Then they have to get into relative surplus value, which is futzing with the productivity of labor um, itself. I know exactly what you mean, though, too, about that for those first couple paragraphs, because it did feel very technically determinist and very odd, because he says at some point, like, that that's kind of like Marx says that history is driven by uh, the productive forces. And it's like, Marx does say that, but Marx also talks about like class struggle and all of these different kind of things that determine histories. But I suppose you kind of understand why he's saying it, right? Because he's trying to make this point, as you said. Um, but yeah, it did feel a little, a little bit like, wait, what am I about to read? Because this feels like technological determinism, as you said, which we're very suspicious of on this, on this show. Um, but yeah, this is to basically say the point that he builds towards in those first few paragraphs is that even though capitalism has developed the productive forces more than any other mode of production, right? Like unquestionably, by far, we have so we have a better productive apparatus now than we ever have. And it is not particularly close, but um, even though that's the case, now capital itself has basically become a barrier to the continual development of productive forces. A big part of this is to basically say that capitalism can never actually deliver on a fully automated productive system. Only socialism can do that, right? Um, and Grossman was basically writing and saying that we have gotten to the point where we're now seeing these depressions, these recessions, cyclical crises, things like this, where capitalism is actually holding the productive forces back. And what does Marx say happens when the productive forces get held back? You generally have a revolution. 
Um, and so the rest of this essay kind of gets into the how and why that all of this is taking place. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is to jump to the end, but um, I might do it briefly anyway, because it does make sense jumping off of this looming specter of technological <laughs> determinism. Toward the end of this essay, he does make very clear that like, the only th the way that this all leads to actual revolution is entirely through the immigration and therefore the necessity of the proletariat to take action in destroying capitalism kind of thing. It's not that um, capitalism is superseded by technological development in some way or other. Um, so you are entirely, entirely right to, to frame it in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the phrase "the complete immiseration of the working class" is one of the more horrifying phrases that we've come across. <laughs> I think definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're, yeah. Um, basically, the whole point of this is like it's the internal dynamics of capitalism, capitalist development, which are also the main cause behind the primary fetter of capitalist development in the long run, right? Um, but one of the things that he is at pains to point out, one of the things that we should try and go into a bit, is the ways in which it's possible to have effectively a constant decrease in the rate of profit. The rate of profit can be falling, but uh, the profit to capitalists in, um, I suppose, relative terms can go up, if that makes sense. So obviously... Um, the capitalists are by investing more and more of the return on capital into a fixed capital, into new machinery, into new apparatuses of production, I suppose. They are, as we pointed out, constantly reducing the... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's the first one, excellent. Constantly reducing the um, amount of labor that's in... that that is represented in, in any particular commodity. But if by doing this, they can actually um, increase in absolute terms the amount of commodities that they make, then they can still continue to, at least for a short period of time, increase the return that they have by making selling more and more commodities, right? And one of the, one of the results of this process of being able to produce more cheaply is that, that you're then able to sort of undercut your competitors kind of thing. And then actually what you can do is start to monopolize the market in some ways and sell more. Um, so there is for a period of time, um, a mechanism for capitalism to grow in terms of the profits that go to capitalists without, um, with the declining rate of profit still happening in the background kind of thing. Um, so it, that is to say that the declining rate of profit isn't always evident when you look at, uh, the state of, um, capitalism in, in times of economic boom, I suppose. Yeah. Well, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think, but it, it is evident though, I would say it's just not evident in profits, um, mm -hmm. in like, in terms of sheer revenue, right? <clears throat> because. Maybe, maybe one set of vocabulary that we should maybe define before we go on is this kind of idea of the absolute versus relative, right? So uh, let's say I uh, have a house and I have two dogs and two cats, an absolute growth in the number of dogs that I have would be, oh, now I have four dogs and two cats. But a relative growth, if they're staying the same, would be like, okay, now I have four dogs and four cats. It doesn't always have to be the same. It could be, you know, it's basically just like what percentage is kind of in relation to these things. That's kind of like the idea of this relative growth, right? So when you look at revenues now of capitalists, you could go, holy shit, you know, Gene McBean or whatever made like $40 billion last year. Capitalism is really doing great. Wait a minute. Why is everything like collapsing? And if you actually look at, say, like the return on investments, then that's actually what, say, like a Grossmanite scholar would look to to be like the rate of profit is falling uh, don't look at revenues that's tricks because they're making more money but they have to invest way more of that money back into the productive sphere and this is kind of like why grossman is such a maybe well thought of marxist scholar or at least like now it's funny because like now more people are talking about grossman i wonder why this essay was written in 1934 i wonder why um 
But just to say, like, there's a quote in here where Maddox says that Heinrich Grossman was the first to point out that the crisis and the final collapse of capitalism must be explained not only by the falling rate of profit, the mere index of profit, but by the actual mass of profit that underlies it, right? So this is the idea that exactly that you're saying, there could be an absolute growth in profits, but relative to the actual return on investment, things are going down. And that's uh, um, an indication that we're going towards another crisis, perhaps the final crisis. And the fact that this never ends, that things constantly continue towards this is why this essay is called a permanent crisis, right? Yeah, there's another good example of um, relative and absolute that's quite uh, evident to us all at the moment, I think, is um, our wages in absolute terms might be going up, right? But that increase is being cancelled out by the increase in prices. So in relative terms, everybody is having a wage cut unless yeah. you're receiving an inflation inflation beating pay rise kind of thing my uh not to let's just say my friend he <laughs> he works for a union right or he's a union rep and my friend his bosses keep telling him why are all of these people complaining about uh you know about the pay they got an eight percent pay rise this year they shouldn't be complaining about pay and my friend who's a union rep constantly has to remind these people well actually real pay inflation is at 12 percent right now so that actually exactly what you're saying dan my friend would say amounts to a pay cut <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who this friend of yours is jack but He's a real they, they sound like they know what they're talking about <laughs> <laughs> he's just annoying let me just say that um yeah so this is, again, it's interesting the way that this mirror is obviously like, this is all one in the same movement. But this is funny because there are a couple points in this, one very explicit point that reminded me of um, capitalism in the web of life. And this idea of investments on, uh, return on investments is one thing because throughout that book, uh, more? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, he talks about energy return on energy invested. Now that was a metric for a long time. Because the energy that you get from, say, like fracking oil uh, is not really enough to like actually for the amount of energy that it takes to get that oil now out of the ground. But he also talks about that we need to take it a step further and talk about uh, capital returned on what is it? Energy returned on capital invested or something like that. Anyways, it's a very similar idea. Um, but yeah, good mm. stuff. The permanent crisis. I'm really pleased that we read this essay immediately after reading um that jason moore book because um i mean in some ways there's just obvious parallel in the sense that he's talking about uh crisis in a slightly expanded way but in one which is definitely inspired by this theory of crisis right he's talking about um a crisis predicated on over accumulation in the same way that uh Matic and grossman are and he's um talking about the tendential fall of the rate of profit and the significance of labor to um, production and the way that capitalists are trying to increase the productivity of labor or um, f yeah and when, when we come on to some of the offsets um, that capitalism finds some of the counter tendencies to crisis that capitalism finds I think we'll find there's quite a lot of parallel between what more talks about and what um, is being talked about in this essay um, when we read the more I he was talking about a crisis of over accumulation um, and I didn't really understand what that terminology meant i sort of i sort of thought that i understood uh, a crisis brought about by the tendential fall in the rate of profit but what that kind of related to how that related to over accumulation um, i didn't really understand uh, but you've just explained it pretty much in the sense that um for capitalism to continue to increase the productivity of productivity of labor um the amount of the return on any cycle of production that has to be reinvested into fixed capital becomes absolute at a certain point. It becomes basically there is nothing left for um, the capitalists. There's nothing because everything has to be reinvested in new machinery. Yeah. Uh, at a certain point in time, like so much is being invested in technology. There is such a degree of um, capital accumulated in fixed capital. Um, that I suppose that effort to um, maintain uh, absolute profits um, is undermined by that process kind of thing. So that's sort of how over accumulation is um, 
the tendency that sits behind the tendential fall in the rate of profit. If that makes mm. sense. Have I got that right, do you think? Yeah, 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 no, definitely. And it's interesting. Overaccumulation is almost a bit of another kind of confusing phrase. But one of these really interesting things, and basically Maddock is, or not Maddock, Maddock and Grossman are saying that this all kind of leads up to capital. You can have all of this capital, but you just can't use it because it's no longer profitable. So he basically talks about how capital can no longer be utilized during these times of peak crisis, right? Because it just makes... It doesn't make, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense to answer so these people. Like they're not going to invest it back into a system where they can't make any money because you wind up with these huge, like complex industrial plants that are just filled with machinery and you've got like, you know, uh, some jerk in the corner slacking off in like, you know, in like a high vis jacket. And that's like the worker there. You know what I mean? And it's just no longer, they can't make as much, they just can't produce enough value for it to be um, profitable. And so you wind up with capital fleeing to like different sectors of the economy. It's really like in these times of crisis, it's no, it doesn't make any sense for someone with a bunch of capital to invest it in some sort of productive apparatus because they're just not going to make enough money. They're not going to create enough value. And so you see it go into either just like directly into tax havens. This is why you hear about like you know, Apple or something, having some obscene amount of money, just like, I guess, just sitting in a bank account, although we know what that means. It's just literally like, oh, it's a, it's a bigger number on the screen. How cool is that? Um, or they go to like slightly safer things like rents, financialization. Um, you know, if you want to make money, I don't think you're going to invest in like a TV plant or something like that, or like a factory farm you're going to go short sell like GameStop or something like that, right? Like you're going to become like a hedge fund guy and do like index funds or something like that. Um, so it's a, you you basically have this weird situation counterintuitively, I suppose, where there's just all of this capital sitting there, but because the rate of profit is so low, they just, these capitalists can't use their money. And it's, just, oh man, it's like, oh, it's, it's like ironic poetry. It's like Scrooge McDuck sitting on a bunch of like worthless money. It's just like, uh, if it wasn't so awful for the working mm. class, it would be fine. Well, I mean, they're fine, right? Um, <laughs> yes. It's, it, it's fine for Elon Musk or whatever. It's fine for whichever particular billionaire who has these billions. Um, but it's both, uh, catastrophic for, I suppose, like human civilization in general <laughs> that we cannot, um, deploy uh, the productive apparatuses in a way which is actually beneficial to humanity, and also it's pretty bad. Oh, well, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not bad for capitalism in the sense that it's the cause of the thing which is wrong with capitalism, but it's kind of the result of the thing which is wrong with capitalism, which is uh, the return on investment. The rate of profit has become so low that there isn't profitable return for any of this investment. So, when you live in a world where there are um, these uh uber wealthy billionaires that is representative of crisis that's not representative of success in capitalism that's representative of uh underlying crisis of capitalism i suppose yeah exactly. I, it just comes to mind now i wonder whether i mean the, the the time that we've had this before was like the various sort of like barons of the 1930s and 20s in america kind of thing like uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the barons. Well, it's it's a, there's an interesting part in this where he talks about how bourgeois economists always think of, you know, that crisis beginning beginning in 1929 as being like it was, you know, the stock market crashed, man, and that's mm. that's what made it all all get messed up. And he's saying, no, 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 no. This that was just like a symptom of the underlying cause. The crisis had been happening, well, permanently, but it had basically gotten, you know been going towards this absolute crisis point for quite some time I forget exactly what year he pinpoints it at but several years before yeah, 1929 yeah. yeah 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 something like that um where there was this crisis of crisis of production where capital just couldn't be utilized in america anymore yeah i mean it's funny to think i mean obviously this essay was written in 1934 right so it's in the aftermath of the crash of, cla crash of the late 20s it's sort of in the um depression era um, and also he talks about like Roosevelt's economic policies as being an effort to stabilize the situation, but actually in his eyes, they are failing or they're not, it's, they're not what, they're not going to be enough to, um, rescue capitalism, to stabilize it, to renew profitability. And there are some quite like, uh, telling points in this 
we'll get onto this in a minute because what this what this points to is the counter both the counter tendencies to the tendential fall in the rate of profit, but also um, how crisis is in some ways something which rescues capitalism and restores profitability. But there are places in this where he's talking about um, the degree of capital destruction that would have to happen to renew profitability. And he does talk about war in some respects as being something that can have the result of restoring the profit rate. Um, but there are some points in this where it almost feels like he's predicting what is to come in the next 10 years kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. the Second World War. Um, well, just really quickly on that, like one thing that um, capital can do is say that there's this big crisis and X percentage of capitalists in the productive sector go out of business. And so there are just all of these um, industrial plants sitting there not being used. That devalues that constant capital and it devalues fixed capital and it basically makes it so that, oh, another capitalist can come in and buy it below its value, right? And it's the same thing with war. If you just go in and, you know, destroy Germany or whatever, or all of France, then you can basically come in and, you know, make things a little bit better. The thing about that now is that there kind of can't really be a war anymore, right? Because, well, obviously because of nuclear weapons, because of mutually assured destruction, um, and that's the one thing that makes me go, maybe maybe we won't be so stupid to pull something like that. Because, hey, if we die, everybody dies. You know what I mean? It's not just the working class that dies. It's also like the capitalists. So that's, you know, we're talking about crisis. Maybe the final crisis won't have anything to do with a global nuclear war. Maybe a regional <laughs> nuclear war, but hopefully not a global one. Yeah. Unfortunately for capitalism, uh, <laughs> yeah. a, a yeah, global war might, be, might not be the way out. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There can be no functional capitalism if there aren't any workers left to contribute their labor to or, the or capitalists process. too. Or it's capitalists, like, yeah. they might have their own little underground bunkers. Little bunkers but you're not coming out for a world. while. I've been yeah. playing Fallout New Vegas. I know how long you got to stay in there. In those vaults. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're 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 quite right. Like um, uh, the result of one of these cyclical crises of capitalism that happens is that. Uh, sufficiently many capitalists go out of business such that all of this productive um, capacity in the form of fixed capital, which was costing capitalists so much to maintain and renew and to do the development to create new and better fixed capital, all that stuff that was incredibly costly suddenly becomes incredibly cheap. And so in a balance between the the return on capital invested in fixed capital and the return on investment invested in variable capital, that organic composition, as we as Mark says, um, is tweaked in the favor of renewed profitability, right? Um, so it's not as if that then the crisis happened and they suddenly employ lots of new people kind of thing, but um, on balance, um, in, in relative terms, uh, the relationship is sufficiently changed. Yeah, such totally. that profitability is restored, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that results from that is uh, increases in monopoly, and something that he talks about as being evident in his time, um, and as being sort of like a symptom, I suppose, of the final crisis of capitalism. And he, he quotes Lenin a few times favorably in um, in uh, paralleling his analysis to Lenin's, I guess as um, this being a sort of symptom of like, uh, if not the final crisis, then the sort of permanent ongoing crisis of capitalism is this tendency toward monopoly. And I mean, that's definitely the age we live in now, right? It's the age of billionaires and it's the age of um, monopoly and sort of like the disappearance of competitive capitalism and it's sort of like replacement with monopoly capitalism. Yeah, and also just a tendency towards generally relying on the state for more and more, right? Like, there's a reason now that productive capitalists, well, capitalists just in general, like, really have to rely on... There's a reason that they don't do any of their R&D, right? Their own R&D. Um, there's the, you know, the well-known book, I don't know what it's called, but it's the Mariana Manzucato book, where she goes through and looks at the iPhone, and she basically says that every single component piece of the iPhone was not developed in the private sector at all. It was all done by the state. That's just because it's not profitable anymore to reinvest back into your research and development. And this is how you get contracts and everything like that, too. So there's a tendency towards monopolization. I wouldn't say that's a total tendency, because 
just be, I suppose, just generally because of competition. But um, there's also this tendency towards, I suppose, like almost like a state monopoly capitalism. It, it's like verging on a kind of like Hilferding esque like understanding of like the general cartel. But I mean, it's absolutely true right now, right? Like the state foots the bill for everything in the productive sphere. And that's, it's been proven correct, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah, particularly as like, I mean, um, I've come to, th I don't know whether this is true really, whether, whether experts would agree with this, but the, what, <laughs> I've come, what I've come to understand as being one of the most important features of uh, our neoliberal version of capitalism is um, states producing markets kind of thing, um, instituting markets into places where they don't really function or don't really exist kind of thing. Um, which seems it seems to me as another symptom of like um, declining profitability and the state's efforts to help um, capitalists maintain profits. I suppose yeah. whether it's through creating markets where they didn't exist before, whether it's through um, selling off previously state-owned assets and then paying a capitalist to run them, kind of thing. Uh, in an increasingly more in a way which is increasingly more expensive for the state um but as a big bunk to these big sort of like um, service providers you know circo in the uk or whoever yeah and also just in terms of imperialism right in terms of relying on states to maintain the status quo and to put down class struggle in the like periphery or whatever yeah, um, yeah, yeah. also i suppose we didn't we haven't really touched on like the listener, if you, the royal listener, I should say, might be thinking, "Hey, this all sounds pretty good, but why doesn't, why don't, why doesn't, why don't all the capitalists just get together and be like, okay, lads, let's call it. We're going to stop investing in our fixed capital here in the constant capital, and we're just going to kind of, you know, where where we see where the falling rate of profit is going. Let's just stop here, and we can keep making money off of the, you know, surplus value as it is before we run out of surplus value entirely." But I know in kind of like progressive circles, it's free market competition is kind of like almost like a bad thing to say, but like competition does play like an extremely important role in the economy. And it's the reason you can never have like total complete monopolies, right? Although this kind of speaks to how you can kind of have that in like it, uh, in name, I suppose, or in reality. Um, but the reason that they can't just do that is because of competition, right? Like the reason that the capitalist is investing in their productive apparatus is to gain an edge on other capitalists. And so if a group, even if like all of the capitalists got together and said, okay, let's just price fix here, let's just stop, another capitalist would come along and be like, oh, well, there's this technology here. I'm just going to start selling TVs for like half the price. So it's, it, it is built into the system itself that this falling rate of profit deal has to happen. There's no way that the capitalist can stop it because, you know, because they're not one person they're not like a coherent one thing they are all in competition with each other so that's yeah just and also there. like yeah and also like well there's a couple of things that come to mind from that one like capitalism can't continue without increasing profits and um increasing uh the amount of value produced um and it's from the mechanisms that allow that to happen under capitalism that you get the falling rate of profit kind of thing. So um, you couldn't have capitalism without growth and without expansion. Um, and as a result, you get the tendency of falling rate of profit. And also one of the points he makes is there are actually different spheres of capitalism and they're inexorably opposed to one another in what they actually want to have happen kind of thing. So um, I don't know whether you could ever get a coming together of all of the different capitalist interests because their interests are inexorably opposed in some respects yeah and importantly right now what we're seeing is the main cleave is between like finance meaning like banking mainly and between the actual like productive bourgeoisie the people in the productive sphere because one really would like uh interest rates lowered please we would really like to kind of you know have this whole recession thing not happen and the other is the exact opposite they need interest rates to rise right so a lot of that has kind of got me thinking about again, when we kind of first came to this idea of um, cleavages in the capitalist class, um, how those play out politically, obviously a famous example of that is, I don't know, the American Civil War, right? But um, there is a potential now, I suppose, for that cleavage to become more and more apparent between banking 
and the productive sphere. Um, we'll see where that goes. Mm. I mean, another good example of that is is Brexit, right? Like yeah. there was there were spheres of capitalism. The productive spheres of capitalism really didn't want Brexit to happen because they wouldn't listen. They uh, necessitated the cheap labor that came from European intra-European migration um, and then finance capitalists seem to be like uh, Nigel Farage is a great example of this uh, finance guy who was pro-Brexit for whatever reason because that seemed how, somehow seemed to align with uh, their particular set of interests I guess yeah not to compare Brexit to the, to the <laughs> American Civil War. How can we make this all about Brexit? Yeah. Um, it is wild now, though, just to bring it back to Rishi Sunak and everybody, that it's just like, oh, remember when there was a time when the Tory party wasn't just like completely Brexiteers? How quickly that like cleavage can happen. You know, it's like you can have Penny Morden, who was, I'm reading, a Brexiteer, or you can have Rishi Sunak, who I'm reading, was a Brexiteer. Mm. Well, you, well, I mean, or you can, or you can have Liz Truss, who was who campaigned for Remain in the uh, <laughs> referendum, and then yeah, she's easy going though, man. She yeah, she'll just go anyway. Yeah, I, yeah, I kind of respect it. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> she's an opportunist. We love opportunists over here, folks. Um, I'm going to read a particularly. It's it's a little. It's well, it's not that long. It's one paragraph. But I'm going to read something just to kind of re get to this idea of why why this crisis leads to, as you were saying, the immiseration of the working class, because I think that's kind of like the main important point that we need to get to here, because it gets us onto the possibility of revolution. Um, so Maddox says, if the additional constant capital is taken out from the surplus value and necessary quantity, then the revenue at disposal is insufficient to take care of the consumption of workers and employers at the prevailing scale. So he's basically saying, if you need to take this money that you need to invest back into your constant capital. If you need to take that out of uh, the workers' share of things, it's not going to go so well. So he says, a sharpened struggle between the working class and the employers over the division of the revenue thus becomes inevitable. But if, on the other hand, the capitalist pressure... Oh, this is written so weirdly. If, on the other hand, the capitalists, by pressure from the workers, are forced to maintain the wage scale and the part earmarked for accumulation thus decreases, the tempo of accumulation slows down and the productive apparatus cannot be renewed and expanded to keep pace with technical progress. All further accumulation must, under such circumstances, increase the difficulties, since for a given population, the mass of surplus value can only be raised a trifling amount. Surplus value flowing from the previously invested capital must therefore lie fallow. I like that. And there arises a surplus of idle capacity, vainly looking for possibilities of investment. Thus, accumulation is a process that inevitably leads to overproduction of capital, to ever increasing unemployment, and to a surplus of capital made unable to function profitably and an unusable surplus population. So this is kind of something I think that gets us into this idea that it's like it is Get the liberal part out of your brain. That's like, it's just these evil capitalists doing evil things. They're evil, disgusting pig people. Don't give them, you know, don't give them any of your time. But they're operating under the laws of the system. It's, they have to basically take it out of the worker's share of profits. Otherwise, the whole technical progress of everything slows down and they can't have that because they need to keep making money, baby. And so this inevitably leads to them taking it out of the worker's share of profits or just no commodities being available to the working class and thus um, the general immiseration of the working class in two ways. Nobody's able to afford any kind of commodities anymore. It's odd considering heating bills here have gone up a million times. And also um, to just a general surplus population of people who are unemployed, right? And uh, that is a recipe for uh, a particularly feisty working class, I think. Yeah, there's a few important things in that in that section um one of the things that comes to mind to me is something we've overlapped this far is the the reason why capitalists or one of the primary results of capitalism's um efforts to increase productivity i suppose i.e by um cre creating commodities more cheaply is one of the things that results from that is actually a cheapening of uh, the value the costs of labor to capitalists um, if you can produce all sorts of consumer goods, whether they're like food or TVs or whatever, more cheaply, then you can actually, because this is coming back to this absolute relative thing, right? Um, in relative terms, you can decrease the 
the share of um, profits that goes back to labor um, because by being more productive, you cheapen the value of labor kind of thing. So that's one of the sort of, and that also functions as one of the sort of counter tendencies to the declining rate of profit. During boom times, one of the things that is happening is that um, capitalists can maintain labor on a lower and lower share of the profits. And so they're then able to reinvest those profits into the fixed capital that we've already established is necessary for the ongoing growth of um, the capitalist mode of production and the forestalling of crisis and collapse. Um, but when you get to the point of crisis, that same desire to um, reduce the returns to uh, the working class, to the proletariat, then sort of takes this like more vicious form where you get into this point of actual um immiseration of the working class i suppose um and then it comes to this point now how 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 far can you push the working class how cheaply how how much can you reduce the costs of labor uh, before you have this pushback um and I suppose there's a few things that result from that. One is the idea that sort of central Marxist idea that like the interests of the, of the working class are inexorably p- opposed to the continued existence of capitalism. And also, as you say, it um, sort of like torpedoes any idea that really all you need to do is have a fair distribution between capitalists and laborers of uh, the proceeds or the results of production, right? Because you have this constant tendency toward crisis. You have this constant falling of the rate of profit. Um, and somebody's going to be squeezed somewhere along the way. It's either going to be the workers or it's going to be uh, the bosses. And um, let me guess who I, it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, that I mean, that depends on how the class struggle goes, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. It's interesting because one of the main critiques of like... <clears throat> kind of like silly neoclassical economics is that they just completely ignore how things actually work in reality, right? They like to say that, you know, there's perfect competition. The markets will sort everything out. The markets are the God. Everything will be fine. Pray to your God and it'll all be okay. But in reality, we all know that like um, businesses collude, they price fix. There's never anything like perfect competition. Bourgeois, right? Because there's a capitalist class, not everybody can ever succeed, right? If that's your definition of succeeding. Um, But there's something interesting that came up in this. What you're saying made me think about it. Like all of this is kind of talking about like a perfect world. And I think, or like a perfect system in which um, everything acts as it should and there are no countervailing tendencies. And one of, I think the great, like, uh, uh, good things? What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, the great good things. The great good thing. One of the great good things about Marxism <laughs> or Marxian like economics, right, is that they, at a certain point, will go, okay, we understand that we're abstracting away from reality here. Let's actually get down into the concrete and understand how things really work to then prove this like general thesis about the underlying laws of value and about overaccumulation and these things. And Manic absolutely does that here, I suppose. Grossman kind of does it as well to talk about these countervailing tendencies. But the main point in talking about those countervailing tendencies, say just like extending capitalist credit or moving your productive sphere to somewhere where they don't have any good labor laws, um, all of these things are of a temporary character, right? Because whether it's because of the class struggle, um, whether it's because, uh, you know, you just can't keep extending credit in perpetuity, they're all basically one part of this greater whole, they kind of like flow, dare I say, dialectically together because these temporary fixes, they are temporary, but they are basically manifestations of this greater underlying crisis. Um, And this is again, like something that we saw in the more in capitalism and the web of life, because he gets on right after this to talk about one of the temporary things that you can do it's just an uh, import cheap, uh, cheap foreign use values for the working class, right? Uh, cheap gasoline in America for the working class to get to their job. Cheap food. Uh, what were the four cheaps? It was food, labor, energy, and materials, energy. I think. Yeah. Like that, yeah, maybe money or something like that. Um, and basically this, in not as much detail as Morris says, obviously, just basically says, 
those are of a temporary character. And Moore would basically say those are of a very much temporary character because we're actually quantitatively running out of those chiefs and of those, uh, God damn it, what's the word? Uh, frontiers. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- it sort of feels like in this, a lot of the frontiers, I guess in Moore's terminology, are kind of like um, economic, I suppose, as opposed to historical, ecological. Um, but they definitely parallel Moore's ones, right? Uh, Matic talks about um, the necessity to cheapen labor in the same way that Moore is talking about ways to cheapen labor. Now, obviously, for Moore, um, what allows for the cheapening of neighbor, labor is the exploitation of some kind of cheap nature that's external to the capitalist mode of production. Um, and there are similar parallels in this with uh, expanding production it talks about places to, I don't know whether he's talking about uh, places in the world, finding places in the world to export to, um, but then that sort of results in creating these places in the world that are required to then turn themselves into um, exporters themselves, which are kind of what it sounds like he's describing is um, the process of imperialism, kind of similar to what Moore talks about, where you find places in the world that are sort of almost external to the capitalist mode of production or sort of sphere of influence or whatever um and then through that engagement with capitalism they're sort of drawn into um the capitalist sphere and then that offset to the tendency of the rate of profit to fall disappears kind of thing so then you suddenly don't have that offset that you had before kind of thing um so yeah a lot of parallels to to um the theory of crisis that Moore was describing um yeah in a slightly different way but yeah yeah, here's a question for you, Dan. Oh, sure. um, the, la- the last line of this is, from a struggle over wages, hours, and working conditions or relief, it becomes, meaning the class struggle, even as it fights for those things, a struggle for the overthrow of the capitalist system of production, a struggle for proletarian revolution. Um, I think I've gone through a number of different like uh, mindsets about work- what working class struggle is and what it represents. And I think I was in my maybe more uh, naive years of the mind that any kind of strike action, any kind of anything that you can kind of pin as being like class struggle, there it is, that the class struggle was socialist by socialist by its nature. And I think that relatively recently I've been kind of questioning that and being like, well, are these things necessarily socialist by their nature? Maybe this is uh, because of what my friend has been telling me about being a union rep, but it's like, is it, is it socialist in its very nature? Is the working class doing a socialist thing by just being like, hey, 8%, 12%, that disparity buster, give us that 12%, you know what I mean? And then we'll all be fine. But this seems to almost put it in a different light where it's basically saying all of those things are part of the class struggle towards socialism, whether the working class realizes it or not, because it is part of this crisis. Um, so I suppose my question, and I, don't, I still, I don't really know where I land on this, but I really do like the way that it's phrased in this. It gives me a bit of hope and kind of gives me a bit of like, hey, left calm guy, that's where it's coming from, mm. um, of like, maybe these struggles are socialist, you know what I mean? By their very nature, even if they're just leading towards, hey, we want a bit more money to pay our heating bills, you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. What it reminds me of is... Um, is... The merger formula, I suppose. Oh what it my reminds, god! What it, what it reminds me of is there is a tendency within capitalism to create a workers' movement, and it's in some ways like this is the ever-present class struggle that we read about all the way back in like episode two when we were reading Ralph Miliband, right? Like um, the class struggle is ever-present under capitalism, um, and I suppose. From this, we can infer that it's always going to create a a reaction from workers. How can it not, right? If if capitalism is always going to move toward greater and greater immiseration of the working class in an effort to desperately try and claw back and maintain profitability, um, it's always there is always going to be a resultant workers' movement, um, and the effort of socialists ought to be to make that workers movement socialist or combine it with to merge it with socialism i guess yeah it's interesting because if you take this god damn it if you take this like at its face value and you basically say 
okay, everything's just working towards this final crisis. Once we get to the final immiseration of the working class, then we can have a revolution and then we can do socialism. And not a moment before, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, speaking of left comms, the uh, of Endnotes 1, right, of the famous debate. Um, and if you think about it like that, then almost counterintuitively, yeah, all of these struggles are socialist by their very nature because they're just working towards this singularity, right? But there is a good point in this where Maddox comes out and says, we can't think about it like that, right? Like, and it's what you're saying, right? It's almost like this merger formula stuff where he is like, capitalism doesn't collapse automatically, right? There's a particularly banger quote from Lenin in here somewhere that I can't find it right now. And I'm not going to search for it, where he basically says something along the lines of there is no absolutely helpless state of capitalism. There is no point where capitalism is going to get to the point where you can just blow on it and it'll fall over, Right. So Maddox basically makes the point, and this was what I was talking about at the beginning about it. here comes some of his politics about like, it's still, we still need to work. And this is what comes after and how quickly that is, is entirely dependent on the class struggle, right? Um, so I found that very like, okay, that makes me feel a little bit good because we don't have to wait for this final collapse before we can do something. That'll just make it easier, right? Then the next line of that paraphrasing of Lenin is, it's dependent on the workers as to how long capitalism will be allowed to vegetate. <laughs> oh, which is quite Excellent work, Lennon. Excellent yes. work. Hmm. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I suppose it is just like a matter of odds and percentages. It's like, well, if you have this many unhappy proletarians on your side, it's going to be really easy to do a revolution. But if you don't, very difficult, right? It's like, yeah, so... Hopefully it'll happen before the complete immiseration of the working class. Um, we'll see. The permanent crisis. What are you going to do? Um, anything else on this, Dan? I think it was uh, it's very illuminating. Yeah, and, you know, I think um, I think it's good. As I was saying, it's um, quite a nice companion to last week's last time's reading. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether I have anything else to say. Go read it. I suppose. Read it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because you totally can take this and come to any number of conclusions about what your politics should be, which I think instead of being like, here's what your politics should be. I'm just saying like, there's a, there's a room for a lot of experimentation in the class struggle right now. And what do we always say? Like, don't hassle your anarchist friends. Don't hassle your cow friends. Don't hassle your left com friends. Everybody's doing their part and we'll just see eventually what works. Cause nobody has any idea what's going to work. You know what mm. I mean? Nobody has any idea. So we'll see. Yeah. Just get yourself some anarchist left com neo cow. <laughs> nihilists uh, ml friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly or, um, or as i've done just find one friend who encapsulates all of them <laughs> yeah exactly one friend who bounces around from maoism to left calm shit uh, you know yeah, one psychopath <laughs> exactly um all right well dan i didn't get an update on if it's actually dark where you're at right oh uh, wait it, it has dark? gotten dark it okay. has gotten dark that's good yeah. yeah whatever weird stuff was going on across the street for me has now ended i think this has worked <laughs> hopefully when i hit stop it won't just delete everything we'll have to redo all uh -huh. of this because i'd actually <laughs> maybe jump out of this window if we had to redo this that but... would be quite frustrating <laughs> um yeah hopefully this is not like Twitch. Yeah, exactly. It's not canceled. like Twitch. We got canceled by we Twitch. We did get canceled by... Who owns Twitch? Does Amazon own Twitch? Yeah. We got canceled by Bezos. What are you going to do? It's probably for the best. Yeah. We'll do it again. We will. And You've we'll, we'll it here and... now. We'll actually tell people. Yeah, exactly. And we'll maybe. try and do an actual, uh, maybe a schedule, although I don't know what that schedule is actually going to be. Um, one last thing before we go, Dan. The baseball playoffs have literally come and gone. Well, for me, uh, since we last recorded because the Dodgers were in it for four games and then they're out. So just an update for our, you know, the crossover baseball fans, auxiliary statements fans, of which there's probably one and it's just me. Um, Dodgers. How, uh, the, how are the Padres doing? Oh, Dan, how are the Padres doing? Oh, they, <laughs> they were kicked out of it last night. How unfortunate oh, no. for the Padres. Uh -huh. So if you, if you just, <laughs> so do, do you have a, do you have a team now? Or? You know what? During that series, I actually got to watch a bit of it. And now I'm, I'm rooting for Philly, baby. They're just this okay. team that shouldn't have even made the playoffs. And now they're just crushing it. It's so much fun. Uh, Bryce Harper, killer home run last night. My man, just cool as a goddamn cucumber. And they're playing the Astros. So that's the main reason why I'm rooting for them. But um, they'll get swept by the Astros. And uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, it's just a sad year for Jack's baseball, in, uh, baseball fan very sad. Dumb ship. I guess. Yeah. Well, dear listener, we will tell you more about when we're going to be streaming on Twitch. Uh, we're still kind of trying to figure it out. So if you want to give us suggestions, Dan keeps saying that he wants to play Among Us on stream. And I've kind of been <laughs> all of them up. But um, we'll see. 
<laughs> Do people still, still play Among Us anymore? I don't know. I just like saying it. Among Us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's our most up to date Twitch reference. Let us know <laughs> yeah. uh, how far, but how many years behind the times we are, and yeah. what should we be playing now? I, I refuse to play Minecraft. I, um, I was thinking the only game that I would consider playing is um, Rome Total War. That's the only okay. good video game that's ever been made. So maybe we'll just do that. Um, we were talking about doing some video. Well, I was trying to encourage doing some video game streaming two years ago when we started this. What it's we've got to do, Dan, is figure out Tabletop Simulator, and then we can oh, play yeah. Kill Team. That would be and sick. Then we could... Although it's 15 bucks, dude. I, I went to oh. look at it. I thought it was going to be free to play. It's 15 bucks. Where mm. these people get off? <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, all right. So, yeah. We'll, monopolistic we'll... rents that we have to pay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. These video game developers sitting on their rents, these fat cats, <laughs> independent video game developers making open source software <laughs> pieces of shit. Um, but, yes, we will be back telling you all about more about the Twitch channel because I think that's going to be very fun. And join our Discord. And, um, yeah, the Twitch stuff might go on YouTube, maybe. Um, we'll yeah, say maybe we could stream to death. Maybe we should just stream to YouTube. Maybe I don't know, and YouTube. not do Twitch. Who knows? I'm much more a fan of being employed by Alphabet instead of. Uh, Amazon, <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. All right, permanent crisis, everybody. That was fun. We're back. Um, we'll be back on it now. Like, sorry for the hiatus, but real life. What are you going to do? And uh, this is very fun. And I enjoyed this. Yes, it's been good. Uh, it's been nice to reconnect with you, Jack. Even through the through the. <laughs> Uh, medium of the internet. I sound like <laughs> such a boomer. I know, it's <laughs> terrible. Um, I'm going to stop talking now before I sort of reveal the fact that I'm actually 65 years old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm 19. So. <laughs> Good. Yes. Thanks to everybody for listening. It's been a pleasure, as ever. music you heard this episode was music to kill bad people to by king gizzard and the lizard wizard if you like this song you can check it out and much much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com be sure and follow us up on instagram twitter and facebook and if you like what you heard be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion till next time Whoa.